in our last uh, uh, in our last uh, uh, session is my good friend and colleague and you may also call him my brother academic Thanks. brother right yeah. he is my academic brother not to say to him uh, go him we are, we are writing intensively together uh, but I'll stick to the formality after calling my brother. Uh, uh, Neil Kedar is the Vice President of the academic, uh, of, for Academic Affairs at Supreme College and the Professor of Law and History. And in the case of Neil, he is uh, a jurist and a historian, in, and, and an historian uh, uh, no, less, no less historian than a jurist. His main fields of interest are Israeli history, modern legal history, legal and political theory, and comparative law. He has published five books and numerous articles in these fields. And with this, I give you the floor. 20 minutes. Bye. Please. Thank you. And it's too much. You know. uh, so thank you very much. And um, I know I'm the, this is the last panel before. Uh, um, <coughs> can summon this wonderful um, workshop. Um, my talk actually, um, it's good that it, it comes after Avi and after Yulia. And uh, I, I wish, I, at the beginning, I wanted to talk about some general feature that you can see here about the civic roots of national solidarity we, without giving you any case study. Uh, but I will start with, uh, with a story, because I'm also an historian. Uh, I will start with the, with the story of the Zionist movement. When the Zionist movement emerged at the end of the 19th century, they had, as the national uh, movement of the Jews that emerged in, in Eastern Europe, where most of the Jews lived at that time, um, they had to consider uh, the way. And one of the things, one of the main ideas, or one of the main decisions that they make as early as the, the, the 1870s and 80s of the 19th century, uh, of course, um, was that, as Avi just described very briefly, that the Zionist movement will deal less with questions of culture, of identity, with questions of what ties us all Jews together and what turns Jews into Zionists, and will uh, stick or give, not prior priority, but give a large place to questions of uh, um, to civic ideas, okay? Question of civic idea, what, what creates a bond, a civic bond among all those different Jews? Now, at the end, I will arrive, I will return to the Zionist movement and uh, um, to, the, to the solution that the Zionist movement gave to that problem. But I want to um, con um, concentrate mostly on the idea of the civic, of civic roots of national solidarity. And my, my main claim would be that national solidarity uh, does not stand on only on shared collective identity, um, but also on a set of uh, um, civic ideas that I would call them civic awareness, civic responsibility, and so on and so forth. And, and the, those uh, um, demands are crucial in order to create uh, um, national solidarity. Okay, and uh, they are also crucial in order to create not only national solidarity, or I mean solidarity in the national level, but also solidarity in lower levels. Um, so my talk today will be divided into four or five parts. And the last, the fifth part, I only added following Avi's presentation, <laughs> uh, because I was afraid that I won't give you any uh, case study, so I return to the Zanis case study. But the four main, the four first part will, uh, the first three parts will deal with those uh, um, civic ideas the civic bonds that are necessary in order to create some kind of national, uh, um, national solidarity. I will talk about uh, um, civil awareness, about civil uh, uh, equality or some sort of fairness, and about civil responsibility. And then the first part of my talk will deal with um, the relation, the complicated, the complicated relation between the more cultural identity parts of national solidarity and the civic parts of national solidarity. And then I will return uh, to wrap up with the Zionist solution if I'll have time for that. And, oops. Um, so one thing that uh, is important is for, for to create a kind of solidarity, either on the national level or on lower level, is a kind of uh, civic awareness, the recognition of the importance 
of living in effective political community. Okay? And this awareness, I would be very brief because I don't have the time for it. Uh, um, this awareness is an awareness, first of all, uh, um, of an awareness of the basic uh, ideas of uh, I have to, to be aware to the other, which is creating those bonds with me. But as I think Michael said, it, if two people consider themselves as part of a, they form a group. And w whenever we have a group, the group is already different than the people that compose that group. And the, the, the people, the, the group that are different from the people who compose this group, we, we should be aware of it, and we should be aware to three, three or two or four uh, um, features of that group. Oops. First of all, that every group, uh, Avi described very uh, briefly, every group has a center of authority. Okay, a center of authority that, receive, that uh, um, decides at the end. That center of authority can be open, can be inclusive, can be democratic and so on, but there is a center of authority, okay, either on the local level or, or on the organizational level, or of course in the national level. A center of authority that decides, that has the, the, the last word, if you want. And this is not a matter of, we want to, to have a center of authority, we don't want to have a center of authority, we must have a center of authority. It does not, support, it does not have to be one person, it can be a group, the center of authority, it can be a, 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 a an institution, but there must be a center of authority, okay? And this is one thing that every national movement has to explain to the people that uh, compose the national movement. Uh, a, second, a second feature is that if we have a group, we already have a group interest. And the public interest, there is a public interest. Okay, which the public interest <coughs> is distinct and is different from the personal interest or from the interest of the, set of the different groups that compose that nation, for example. Now, uh, and again, we have a public interest. Now, there is another, there is another question, of course, like we have the question about the, the, like we have the question about the center of authority. As I just said, we hope that the center of authority would be democratic, would be open, would be inclusive. We want that the public interest would be an interest, a public interest that is uh, uh, shaped according to uh, democratic decisions and democratic procedures. Okay, this was if if I return for a second to the night to the Zionist movement, it was a main feature of the Zionist movement since its inception uh, that the Zionist movement operates according to uh, in democratic procedures, in, in which both men and women vote for the Zionist Congress and the Congresses in themselves are uh, managed in a democratic way. So uh, uh, civic awareness, we have to have an awareness to the need of a center of authority. We have to have an awareness to the need of uh, public, in of the, the, there is such thing called public interest, which differs from personal interest. And we have to have, to, we have to be aware that whenever we have a group, the group has to work according to specific rules. It can be written rules, it can be non-written rules, but the group operates according to some rules or some, uh, I won't enter in now into the, the, the concept of what a rule is, um, but every group operates according to certain rules, certain procedures, and usually with institutions. It's another thing that people must be aware of. Again, if I will return to the history of the Zionist movement, it was a central tenet of the Zionist movement since the beginning. It was really a legalized movement. It had formal institutions, formal rules, procedure, and so on and so forth. Now, again, um, this is, these requirements are requirements that are apart from the requirements that has to deal, to do with identity, with culture, with shared identity, shared values, shared culture. This is a demand or a set of demands that um, must be applied uh, or must be at the consciousness of the people that uh, compose that uh, national or other group. Uh, the, second, the second idea is uh, the idea of kind of civic equality. I agree with Avi that equality is not perhaps not the word, but there, there must be a mutual feeling of civic equality of all the people that compose that group under the laws of the group, under the rules. If it is on the national level, so people are equal both under the law, the law operates in a, in a general manner, in personal manner towards all the partner, all the people that compose that group. And also there is a very interesting idea 
when we talk about national solidarity, the very essence of the idea of nationalism is an idea of that the people that uh, are part of that nation are equal under the nation. I mean, they are all parts of, not citizens, but they are all parts of that nation. And I will arrive to it later. Um, <coughs> and that there is an obligation of the future state uh, to treat all citizens uniformly, impersonally, uh, impersonally, and inclusively. This is another part of um, civic awareness, that kind of minimal or basic equality, both under the law of the, the, the organization of the nation state and under uh, um, the nation. Again, if I return to the, the Zionist history, this was also, as I said earlier, this was the main feature of the Zionist movement. Since its inception, it was very legal, very uh, deeply legalized in all uh, senses of the word. And the third part of those civic bonds, the civic awareness, is, a, is an awareness to civic responsibility of all the, the future citizens, or of all the partners, the, the, the people that compose the nation, both towards society in large or towards the nation, and towards their fellow citizens. We have a, a deep sense of responsibility. And that deep sense of responsibility it is an important feature of, the, of national solidarity, of <coughs> solidarity um, in, a, in a lower uh, level. And as I, this kind of solidarity is not only, it is reciprocal solidarity, but also solidarity entails uh, activity because responsibility, so I'm, I'm sorry, responsibility entails activity because res responsibility is always active. If I'm responsible to someone, I have to, uh, to act. I can't sit on my chair and say, well, I'm responsible to my children, for example. I have to bring, to put food on the table. So what I wanted to say to sum up until now is that um, when we talk about national solidarity or solidarity in the lower level, we, have, we must not ignore also the civic features of that solidarity. Not only talk about questions of identity, of culture, shared values, and so on, but about those, this set of civic responsibility and civic awareness and a basic uh, um, a kind of uh, um, um, civic, uh, civic equality, awareness, and uh, responsibility. Now, um, this is not to say that we can ignore the other parts, OK? The parts that deal with identity, with culture, with shared values, and so on and so forth. And at the strength of every social and national solidarity is the product, or it lies, in the interaction between the formal parts, that I call the civic parts, and the cultural or identity parts. Because those cultural and identity parts, of course, are essential as well. We cannot have a, a strong sense of solidarity if we don't have them from our guts, if you want. Things that tie those uh, people together, I think Michael re referred to it uh, earlier in his talk, um, like uh, cultural, religion, set of values, and so on. We discussed it in the last two days. Um, it is a combination of both, uh, um, of both sides. And I want to uh, conclude my short talk today um, by returning to the Zionist uh, um, history and try to show you or to tell the story uh, of how did the Zionist movement dealt with that combination of formal civic uh, um, parts and inf uh, what I call informal uh, um, uh, parts, uh, cu cultural components, cultural identity components. And I called in a book that I wrote, uh, published two, three years ago, <coughs> I called the Zionist solution the modest cultural option. And the modest cultural option was, on the one hand, to adopt severely those civic formal components that I've just described. On the one hand, I mean, as I just said, you have to believe me, but I didn't have time to uh, elaborate on this here. Uh, um, but as I just said, both the Zionist uh, um, uh, movement, the Jewish community in Palestine, and later the State of Israel were deeply, deeply legalized from their very inception. And very, uh, uh, very much, and they were very uh, uh, institutional, if we might say so. I mean, they had uh, strong institutions. It was an ordered society from the beginning. So this was one part, and legality was very deep 
uh, both among the, the design, within the Zionist movement and within the state of Israel. And I have many examples since day one of the, the state and so on and so forth. I don't have the time, and I think. And the pre state. And the pre state, of course. Um, but in addition to that, in addition to the central place that the Zionist movement gave to those formal civic legal features that create those bonds of solidarity, the, what the Zionist movement did as well was to adopt a modest cultural pro, uh, uh, option that I that can be uh, described as follows. First, it had two main features. The first one was what I call the muting, muting cultural policy, a muting cultural database. This is what I, I was trying to say, Yulia, to, uh, when, in our short discussion this morning. Um, the, the, the Zionist movement, since its inception in the mid-18th century, tried to avoid as much as possible um, debates that had to be with identity, with religion, with culture. And even if they had those debates, they tried to avoid writing them down in formal documents or write them down in formal de declaration. And I believe, and I, this is my entire book, that this is the reason, for example, that Israel does not have a constitution until this very day, because they were afraid of the preamble. And I, first of all, I wrote a book about seven years ago about Ben Gurion and the Constitution at first, and Ben Gurion wrote it down that it was a, he didn't know what to, to do with that preamble. Not only him, but uh, the Knesset, the first Knesset. At the beginning, I thought, ah, this is only, it's an excuse. They didn't want, you know, they didn't want the rule of law. But on the other side, there was very strong rule of law from the beginning. So, and then I tried to look on, at Zionist history that preceded the state of Israel and preceded Ben Gurion since the, the end of the 19th century and since the day of Theodor Herzl and others. And I found out the same ideas, both on the Zionist left and the Zionist right. Jabotinsky, for example, has almost the same word by word that, to, to what Ben Gurion said and among the religious Jews and non-religious Jews, and trying to avoid as much as they can the cultural uh, the cultural debates, or at least if they have a debate, they don't want any sign of that debate in formal, uh, in formal uh, um, documents or in large declarations. I think the, the only large declaration is the Declaration of Independence, the Israeli Declaration, and even it, it's relatively modest with regard to questions of identity and culture and tries to... It's uh, vague. I'm sorry? Vague. It's very vague, of vague. course. It's like avo avoidance. Yeah. And the second thing is that since the, the Zionist movement was the, uh, the Jewish national movement, they couldn't avoid completely the question of, uh, of culture of, and of identity because this was the, the, the thing, if you want, that attracted the, the Jewish masses <coughs> to the Zionist movement. They had to uh, um, rely to those issues. Um, so what they tried to do is to avoid all the issues that are contested. So for example, they have created, if I remember, Avner perhaps knows, not perhaps, knows much more, than, much better than I, the, the Ministry of, the Israeli Ministry of Education, I think, was established only in 1950, if I recall. Only two years after the state was established because until then, since the end of the 19th century, the Zionist movement decided that since education is a contested issue that also created violence uh, among parents, that the Zionist movement would not deal as a movement with the question of education. The only, uh, the main uh, uh, decision of the Zionist movement was to establish the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. And this was a decision already taken in, 19, in the first Congress in 1897, okay? But the, 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 uh, the, the institution, uh, but the, the Zionist organization as an organization would not deal with education. Only in 1950, with the mass immigration to Israel of Jews from all over the world, hundreds of thousands of Jews, they, and the decision was that every party and every locality will deal with its own uh, education system. And then when uh, 200,000... Only in 53, only 53 they had exactly. the, the, what they call the, the, state the, law the state law of education. Exactly. So uh, thank you so much, Amir. Uh, only five years after the establishment of the state, they understood that they have no choice, choice I'm sorry, but they have to create. They cannot rely on that. Uh, a provisional system that in which the localities or the political parties deal with education and they have to create to establish their own state, what we call mamlachti or mamlachti, uh, not mamlachti, mamlachti. Yeah, this is where Shabak and the One day I had a Shabak came into my office at Bar Ilan asking what mamlachti is. Um, so 
They try to avoid as much as they can contested issues and to embrace those issues that were not so contested, such as the Hebrew language. That, that is why, although most of the Jews all over the world did not speak Hebrew, the, the, the Zionist movement adopted the Hebrew language. They have adopted to the devotion or to, to the, what they call, we call the land of Israel, uh, um, in the sense that the, 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 Israel, that the, the Zionist that the state would be established in, in, in Palestine or in the land of Israel. Uh, um, the evocation of Jewish history, the story that once upon a time there was a Jewish people that was created here somewhere in the Middle East, and then uh, um, uh, it was exiled, uh, and now there is a Jewish diaspora all over the world, and now the Jews will reunite to, that, uh, to, the, to the land of Israel, to Palestine. If we can... <coughs> Debate it until uh, the next uh, next year if it is if this story is uh, uh, historically true or not. But this is a story that every Jew knows, uh, religious or non-religious, and this is why it was embraced by the Zionist movement and uh, a set of consensual Jewish symbols, values, or concepts that again were in consensus among most of the Jews in the world, both Ashkenazi and Mizrahi Jews, religious and non-religious, those symbols. It's another question how those symbols and values were embraced and what, um, what, what the, 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 the organization did with them. But this was the way of the Zionist movement to, uh, to deal with this uh, issue. So I wrap up my, uh, um, my talk, because I can talk about each and every part of it for an hour now. Um, I'm finishing. Um, in order to uh, create or establish a, a strong and a deep national solidarity, also social solidarity on lower level, um, the group has to take in mind, uh, to take into consideration not only the what I call the non-formal uh, um, features of that of the group features such as identity, culture, and so on, but also what I call the, the formal or the civic uh, um, parts of that bond, of that solidarity. And those parts are considered, first of all, are, it's a sense of awareness, of consciousness about what, what does it mean to, to, to have a group? What does it mean to have a, a nation, if you want, if you're talk, we talking about national solidarity, about the kind of equality and fairness that must be part of that, must be a, a main feature of that group, and about the mutual responsibility of each and every part of that group towards both the group and the other uh, um, parts of that group. And, but that we cannot avoid both parts of the, uh, of the story. We cannot avoid the, the question of identity, culture, the idea, of course, that every group has subgroups, of course, every nation has sub. Uh, you know, is divided into subgroups, uh, as we heard this morning, and of course we know religious subgroups, uh, um, socioeconomic subgroups, and so so on and so forth. And the uh, and we must uh, um, tolerate them and see how we deal with those uh, uh, both uh, um, both parts of that uh, uh, national solidarity, national bond, understanding that each part strengthens the other parts. I mean, it's not that we can deal only with the civic formal parts or only with the identity parts. If we want to create a strong, uh, of course, an, an open and inclusive uh, um, nation, if you want to say, uh, we have to embrace both parts. Thank you very much. Mr. Manager? problems of uh, fitting into modernization. And mm -hmm. these problems are political problems and they are economic problems in, in first and foremost. And, and then, uh, if you look at it from this uh, perspective, it, is not, uh, um, it makes perfect sense that uh, cultural debates won't be uh, the, the, the main uh, thing. They only be, if I understand, they only become the main thing once uh, uh, in the state of Israel is founded and suddenly there's the um, 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 
the meeting point of Jews from Europe and Jews that are not from Europe, and suddenly the Jews that are not from Europe it become uh, a great part of, uh, and, and then these questions start becoming uh, a much greater issue. And because, I mean, of course, within uh, um, uh, the Jews in Europe, there was, there was also a, a great question between you know, the German Jews and these Jews, but because they were all under the uh, uh, paradigm of uh, uh, modernization, then they, they all said, okay, we're well, in this place, but we know where we're supposed to go. And I think that in many issues, in many, in many as you say, the current debate is questions of today when we no longer talk in this with the paradigm of modernity and see modernity as uh, something bad that we need to, or something we need to be critical of, that, um, the, 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 and after the cultural turn, you can say that suddenly culture takes a big issue. So if you do a historization, it is not really that surprising in my opinion that they did not want to talk about culture and, and these issues at the time. I don't know, maybe I get it wrong, but this is oh, how okay. I see it if you look at it. Shall I answer every uh, question, or uh, yeah, shall we, we gather some more? We, we, we'll take three okay. questions. Right. Hello, thank you. Uh, from a conceptual point of view, your model, you emphasize the civic aspect. But I wonder if there's not a necessary condition, this is the case you show, that there is a strong ethic bond. Or to what exactly. extent this uh, civic model could be, can be applied for uh, other societies without the necessary uh, shared uh, ethnicity? And the second question is, uh, you talked about institutionalism and the rule of law. And I, could you elaborate more about the distinction between having a formal institution and the rule of law? Because I'm not sure that the Zionist practice, even until today, is based on the notion of the rule of law instead of the rule of practice. Elaborate. Thank you. We up there, and then we, that's the first round. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to try to, to offer a different model uh, to yours concerning the relationship between nationalism and, and civism, in which case you might say that strong nationalism <coughs> does not depend on strong civic identity, but the yep. other way around. I totally agree. Wait, wait. The nationalism, strong nationalism camouflages, mm -hmm. tends to let people to ignore the social, uh, economic, uh, ethnic differences. So you apply nationalism in order to say to people, hey, you are all equal. But in fact, they're not equal at all, also from a civil point of view. I totally agree. OK. Uh, OK, uh, thanks for very good questions. Uh, I'll try to answer them. Um, uh, so first, Boaz. Um, I agree and disagree with you. I agree with you uh, in the sense that something happened since the, I don't know, since the 1980s, even perhaps even before, since the 1960s, what we call the emergence of the identity discourse and the, the cultural turn and so on and so forth. So of course today we are in a different uh, uh, place than we were uh, beforehand. Uh, this is why, for example, if we look, if we tend to look at the Israeli law, for example, only from the 1980s you would find uh, um, you'll find identity or question of identity within Israeli law. Until then, uh, as we spoke this morning, you, you wouldn't even find the word Jewish in the laws of the Knesset because they try to avoid it. Uh, and since 1980, we have, uh, um, I don't have the time now to elaborate, until the nationality law. Uh, and I was totally opposing all those laws. I went to the Knesset. I want to speak with everybody. I say it's funny that the Israeli rights, uh, the Israeli right is the, uh, um, uh, um, try to pass those laws when actually those laws are, are post-Zionist, because the Zionist uh, um, policy was the avoidance of dealing with those issues altogether. And now they try to uh, legislate the, 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 the lost preamble of the Constitution that we didn't have. We have uh, uh, our Constitution is the uh, for, formed of uh, basic laws which are different. We have a preamble. Um, so, in that sense, you are right, but you, I think you are wrong, excuse me, in the sense that I believe that, I, I think that culture was extremely central at the time as well, in the, during the 90s and early the 20th century, extremely uh, central 
Um, for, think of well, you were talking about the, the uh, between the German uh, Jews and the Austrian, uh, and, and we are talking about 90 something percent of the Jews that live in, in Eastern Europe, and so you have between. Western and Central Europe vis-a-vis -vis Eastern Europe, and then you have yeah, all over Europe. The idea of modernization. No, no, but to say we should not go to modernization. We need to keep up. That is not. It is. It is because when you're talking about about 10 million Jews living in Eastern Europe, and they are strongly divided almost upon on everything. They are after 100 or 150 years of uh, well, uh, of a Kulturkampf between people. religious and non-religious, of uh, between progressive and more conservative Jews, progressive both from the religious point of view and from the modernist point of view. And so you have huge uh, um, uh, um, uh, um, combative you know, the diversity. So for example, the, and the people don't accept Zionism, they have other alternatives, they can be communist. No, 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 even, even, even within Zionism, the first Zionist debate already in the 1870s was that... Education. Uh, not only about education, but uh, um, some of the Maskilim, the progressive, wrote... Yuda uh, Leib... Um, no, uh, before Zionism. Before Zionism, wrote Lilian Blum, the first lovers of Zionism, said, oh, you cannot immigrate to Palestine before we solve the problem of the religious. Okay, what do we do with the religious people or the ultra-religious, the Haredi? Um, and Lillenblum answers him what he wants us to do. And we will go, we will immigrate to Israel, and then we will continue our battles there, our cultural battles. But we cannot dedicate most of our power to those cultural battles because that will be the end of the, the, the all, 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 only, you know, uh, um, the very new, the very young uh, Zionist movement. And then uh, Hadam writes them. Hadam was the main uh, intellectual. Um, this is why, by the way, uh, when I'm uh, 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 teaching that, <coughs> that, that issue, my students are, most of them are with the Hadam, or most of my colleagues think that I'm an idiot. Uh, um, not because what I'm, uh, I write is wrong, but because I'm an idiot and the Zionists were idiots, because we have to settle this cultural issue with courage. My, most of my, my colleagues in the university or my, I don't know, artists and writers, it's not that I'm, I know, uh, um, they think we have to solve this problem with courage. We have to solve the problem between religious and non-religious Jews. And we have to, like Shachar and my friends from the law faculty in Tel Aviv, they are sitting in the law faculty in Tel Aviv and they believe that they can solve the problem of Israeli society and Israeli culture. And I, and I want to ask them, what do you want to do? Do you want to, to find a definition for modern Judaism and then we'll send the missionaries to all the Jewish world, you know, knocking on the door and say, good morning, ma'am, good morning, sir. We are very happy to tell you that we have a, a solution to the problem of modern Jewish identity. I mean, so you have intellectuals that try to do it for more than 100 years. And the thing is that within the, the, the Zionist movement and later within Israel, it was the politicians that tried to uh, ease down those uh, issues. And, and, and I'll stop here, and I move to, to Gal and, and, and Avner. Um, I, 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 um, the first question, Gal's first question uh, is connected to what Avner says, so I'll start with the Gal's second question. With the rule of law, I agree and disagree again. I, I, um, there is the rule of practice, and we all the time we said that uh, Mapai or the Zionists, we are very practical, but it's, it was still a very law oriented practice. And you can see that since the early days of the, 19th century, of the 20th century, and later, the, the Day of Israel, I wrote extensively on it, so I have many, many small questions. I don't have the time now here to elaborate. Um, they are really following the rule of law in the basic sense, that the, rule, the law must be uh, um, positive and written laws and, and published in advance, and that the law must be general uh, to everybody. And this is why, following Avner's question, when they, they have to deal with the Arabs, they do like this and that, like the Americans did with the Japanese, and like uh, all the, the other Western countries deal with their minorities or with, uh, problems that they, they, they don't want to they have to tackle. Um, but it was strictly, strictly legal from day one. I mean, even though you have a formal. Uh, um, I mean, they love formalities. When you say legal, it sounds. No, no, no. They loved formalities. They were like. It wasn't only formalities, it was a deep conscious issue with regard to the law. I, I believe so. Again, deep faith, I. I deep faith and formalities. From t for 25 years now, I, even before I finished my doctoral studies, I'm in a minority, and I'm used to, uh, um, but I am... Um, Stone minority. <laughs> I, I will say ju well, just that. If it wasn't so deep, 
How come Israel is still a democracy with all the problems that we have in our borders and inside the country? All the problems that you mentioned today. How come? I mean, uh, to take Denmark or Sweden to be a democracy, that's nothing. But to take India or Israel to, uh, to be a, a stable democracy. I mean, you have buses uh, uh, exploding here, and Jews are killing Arabs, and Arabs are killing Jews, and you have, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a crazy uh, uh, immigration society that tripled its, that doubled its uh, population after three years, doubled its population and tripled it in less than a decade. It's crazy, all the problems, the cultural problem, the, the economic problem, and so on and so forth. And in spite of all those problems, there is deep, and it's, it, it, it's not only formal, because it's not only a disguise or something, it's really deep. Do we have many things that we have to amend in our democracy or the rule of law? Of course we have. Uh, every state has, and Israel, of course, we have a, a lot of things. First of all, the discrimination against the Arab citizens, of course. We have many uh, deficiencies and problems in Israeli uh, democracy, but it's still, it is very deep, and it, it has, it started not only in 1948, it starts years and years and years beforehand. You can take every kibbutz, every institution, in the 1920s or 1910s, and they are deeply legalized, and they have procedures, and they have debates about those issues. It's, it's a cultural issue. It's not only a formal issue. Uh, of course, we have many problems. Um, Avner, I totally agree. Uh, I believe that uh, um, not only nationalism camouflages, but I think nationalism, uh, uh, and many of our friends wrote about it, uh, um, is, uh, it, nationalism is a condition in order to understand, we wouldn't have modern democracy, wouldn't have modern rule of law, wouldn't have modern uh, cynicism or mamlachtiyut without the idea of nationalism. Because the idea that each and one of us, each and every one of us, is equal to other to our compatriots under the nation, even if, even if it's a story, it's an imagination, it's not true. But this, the very essence of this idea, uh, enables democracy, enables the idea that uh, I will accept that you and I will have. Uh, the same, our votes will count the same. Uh, you will have one vote, I will have one vote. Uh, the, the sense of, national, of nationalism is a, is a condition that we will accept the idea of the rule of law, in which, according to which the law uh, applies equally uh, in a general manner to, uh, to all of us, and that we will accept all those civic ideas that we are somewhat equal. So I really accept your idea, and, and this uh, has to do, uh, Gal, with your first questions uh, about strong uh, ethical bonds. I mean. The Zionist uh, project wouldn't succeed without strong ethical bonds from the guts, as I call them, ethnic, religion, and so on. The thing is, was that a, a combination of how you walk on that thin line and you prevent nationalism to uh, to uh, or good nationalism to 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 become bad nationalism or uh, totalitarianism. Uh, this is a very thin line. Uh, and indeed, in Israeli history, not, not always uh, um, we, were, we succeeded to, to, to keep that, that thin line, but in most of the time we did. And this is really the, the very interesting and very complicated uh, issue of how you keep both of them. Because without those things, you cannot attract the, the, the masses, or you cannot create a group. Only with civic ideas, it's, it's, it's cold, it's formal, uh, it's nothing. But you have to have most. And you have to walk, uh, I don't know, between the lines or on the thin line in order to keep both of them. And in order both to attract the people and to uh, um, uh, um, turn them to, to, to be active citizens, but on the other hand, not to, uh, not to let them uh, cross to the other side, uh, to pass the law, to, 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 to act against democracy, and so on and so forth. Um, OK. If we, can we? Okay. We have a lot to, yeah, to, yeah. to say about it, but we want to, to hear uh, remarks by Julia, uh, and Thomas, and uh, Brad. I think I, I retract my question because it feels very naive to me, and I was going back and forth with it, so I'll retract it for now. Okay. Once <laughs> minute. You're allowed to be naive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm super naive, but I'm coming now anyway from a different perspective. I would connect first to Avner's mm -hmm. uh, question because, um, and it's a theoretical comment. You said there's, uh, with the civic awareness, this tension between individual and collective interest or public interest. Thomas, can you raise your voice? Uh, yes? Oh, it, it, it's, nobody it's, told me that I'm doing yeah. that. Oh, yeah. That's fantastic. <laughs> okay. Um, it's, it's not a contradiction. It's yeah, no, no. And, and, wait, and I think this is 
sometimes it's taken as the contradiction, but I think the more important thing is the distance within the collective interest. This is the point of the national identity to say, if we share one identity, then we are supposed to agree. And now people come up with different ideas about what's our nation, and that produces exactly the strong distance, mm -hmm. not between individual and collective, but between the different collective of course. interests. And that is the important part. And so you took it and later up with this kind of muting the cultural debate. But that is exactly the essence. So there will never be a, say, a national identity, but of course be many, with many conflicts. And that may just continue. Um, actually, now and one word for authoritarianism, of course it can be forced, people can be forced to see it in one way, but of course this will uh, never work without, say, further promoting conflict with the coercion part of punishment. Mm -hmm. That would be mm -hmm. one mm -hmm. part, certainly. Mm -hmm. And I think that is just as a theoretical comment, so if you don't give this the weak fundament of the individual collective, then you can make also this kind of muting cultural distances so strong because that is the central conflict mm -hmm. that derives exactly as you also referred to. Because we share one category, mm -hmm. one common idea where we should agree, that's just an assumption, because we don't care about disagreements of course. if they're just from the others. Mm -hmm. But if it's one of us, I would say, ah, we have to solve that. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, this is just this. OK. Right. Um, yeah, I think my comment relates to uh, yeah, Athens and, Tom and Thomas's comment, but it also relates to, I think, you know, and maybe we'll discuss this in the last session, you know, some, some other things that have been discussed around the relationship between civic culture mm -hmm. and, 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 and nationalism or national engagement. So certainly, and I think, you know, in, in the case that you've provided, you know, the civic spirit, civic bonds, you know, can reinforce the nation. Mm -hmm. but you can have strong civic bonds that also challenge the nation. Of course. Yeah, right. And, um, but I think, you know, there tend to be, a, I think there's tend to be an assumption, and, you know, in my kind of, that that, or that wasn't explored in your paper, right? So it seemed that, you know, that, so it's kind of, not that, uh, you know, again, it's something you didn't discuss, but I think, you know, we've kind of haven't really looked into the, there's an assumption that, oh, well, you've got a strong civic culture and that's going to spill over into a, a strong national, national attachment and strong yeah. national solidarity, but it can be the complete opposite. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, thanks very much for the, the remarks. I, I'll I try to be, I, I'll be very, very brief and then we'll continue later. Um, yes. Um, again, I, I agree with both of you. I think that not only we, uh, um, um, we must have strong civic bonds, not only civic bonds, we, we must have strong uh, a civic awareness that relies on the, the idea of the individual and the individual rights and freedoms uh, um, that comes even before the nation uh, um, and is even more important than, than, than the nation. So, uh, um, so of course the individual not only can but he has the duty also uh, um, to disagree with the collective. Uh, um, uh, because it's, we are talking, I'm talking at least about an open society. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so it's, uh, this is one of the main uh, uh, conditions and one of the main features that uh, if we talk about uh, civic equality, uh, civic equality uh, lies on the idea of, of individual rights and freedoms uh, and responsibilities. Um, so it goes hand in hand. And if we, if we're taking the Zionist movement and, and, and this answer is also brought, uh, Bart, uh, um, it was one of the most, not only open societies, but also conflictuated society with many conflicts till this very day, as Julia just described mm -hmm. uh, so eloquently this morning. Um, uh, Jews and Arabs and religious and non-religious and Ashkenazi and Sephardi and many other uh, rifts and, uh, and, and conflicts. Um, they, they managed to stick together, I think, thanks also both thanks to the, to the, the, the national identity and, and so on and so forth, but also thanks to the, 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 the basic uh, ideas that from a civic point of view, uh, we must work according to a certain way uh, um, of working. And I can, I, I take it, of course, I, I, I agree that uh, sometimes 
because those civic ideas and, uh, are so strong, they can, they can work. And if they do so, perhaps it's for the right, uh, for the good, I'm saying, for the better, against the kind of national uh, um, bond or whatever you call it. Um. I will unretract my question. Okay. It's not a. It's not. It's not a question. It's really a. It's, look, I don't think that Jews are one people. Of course. Um, and um, and it always puzzled me when you started talking and you said the, the civic awareness and I said, why is civic awareness in your talk identical with Jewish civic awareness? Why was it organized around the Jewish thing? Now I understand the historical context. I understand the geopolitical things. I understand. Um, than the other national movements, but but why wasn't it organized? Would it ha wouldn't have it been organized more effectively as a civic uh, awareness mm -hmm. around mm -hmm. cultural ties, around ethnic ties, so sub-ethnic ties? Why around the Jewish story? Because uh, that's a great question. Uh, okay. the, uh, it was organized around the but Jewish. Who in his right mind would think that we can create one? you know, cohesive civic awareness around this category. They knew that they wouldn't be able to, but any other, any other, uh, um, I don't know, category wouldn't be better. And we, it, it, return, it returns to both questions. They were divided almost over every issue. And I'm talking only about the Jews in Eastern Europe, which were more than 90% so of the Jews. Why not find another category? If this is so impossible and we need to mute all the things we need to mute. Well, by the way, when I say mute, when I say mute, I must say they didn't mute it. I mean, there were deep discussions among the Jews, among the Zionists, about every issue. The thing is that those debates didn't enter the Congresses for most of the time, and even when they entered, they were never finished in formal. Uh, uh, um, uh, um, avoided voting. Avoided voting. Avoided. Let, let me just explain. For example, uh, Yulia, Yulia de described the question about uh, Saturday, the, the Jewish Shabbat. So if you take the Jewish Shabbat from the early days, uh, this was one major issue uh, among the Zionists since the, the, the end of the 19th century. There is no law of Shabbat of the Israeli Knesset, and thank God, I hope there won't be. But the, 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 the question whether we have open stores in Saturdays uh, in Israel or not is decided according to zoning laws, zoning bylaws, not even laws, zoning local bylaws that decide that in each and every neighborhood, if you have a certain uh, a number of religious people or non-religious, OK, so are you are allowed. That, I mean, it's on the local, uh, it's a decision that is taken on the local because, uh, on the local uh, um, level, because they don't want to discuss it uh, generally. What they just said at the beginning is, and by the way, they said it not only because of the Jews, but because they knew that when they would immigrate to Palestine, there would be Arabs also. So they said, they said that we try to be as general as we can, to create a kind of a roof above all the Jews in the world. And everybody can join, men and women, Ashkenazi and Mizrahi, uh, German Jews and Austin Juden, uh, and religious and non-religious, progressive and conservative. Whoever wants to join, let's join in. Uh, we promise you that we will have some uh, uh, local decisions. Uh, so for example, the, 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 the main Congress would not be on Saturdays on Jewish holidays, so the religious and non-religious. And that the, the kitchen, I'm finishing, and that the, the joint kitchens would be kosher so that everybody can eat in those uh, kitchens and that we, don't, we won't deal with education. Except for these uh, matters, we won't discuss anything that has to do with culture, religious, or uh, religion, I'm sorry, or identity as much as we can. And so we try to avoid those issues, keep the open society, and go to Israel and then continue our battles. And you know, you looked at Israel, at contemporary Israel, and I, in, in that sense, they succeeded. I mean, they moved to Israel. Now they have, we have around 10 million inhabitants in Israel, about 80% Jews and 20% non-Jews, and most of them Arabs. And it's a rather open society. We can uh, have a discussion about that. Yeah. And I'm stopping. And there is all those debates, you know, between the different groups. Um, but we are debating, and it's functioning. <laughs> Thank you. No, no, no. Uh, and you mentioned it's not one society. It's one civic organization.